Hi, everybody, and welcome to the bathtub. This is, um, uh, I thought today we would talk about a writer I've developed a fondness for over the past uh, couple of years, uh, Thomas Ligotti. He's got a kind of felt cult following, so there's like a small group of kind of aficionados who know about him, and, and, and he's quite uh, probably over regarded by those people, and generally probably isn't very well known, and he deserves to be generally better known and less treated like a like an icon. That's my philosophy of Ligotti. Uh, he's a very interesting writer. Um, I'll say a few things first. I, it, for many years, I, I've always loved, as I hope you see from the variety of books we do, I pretty much like every type of genre. I like science fiction, fantasy, uh, literary fiction. I don't really, I have no, uh, I try not to have many filters when I read. I like to be trying new things. And the one genre I did not read at all and really disdained, to be honest with you, up until a couple of years ago was horror fiction. And uh, I don't want to typecast people like Robert Aikman, Aikman, who we talked about a few months ago. Robert Aikman, here I'll show you a good book of his. Um, we talked about Robert Aikman a while back, and that was a fairly, uh, a lot of people were interested in that, that talk and are interested in Aikman. And he was also associated as a horror writer, um, and I just really never read much of it. And I guess when I, when I was younger, I remember reading H.P. Lovecraft or trying to read H.P. Lovecraft and all that really florid, over-the-top prose, and the type of prose where whatever someone said, how horrible everything is, how horrible, it's unutterably horrible. You know, you, I just always would get really bored, and I couldn't finish any of those stories. So I, I ignored most horror fiction for a long time, and I dismissed it. And... Only in the past uh, couple of years, when I have sort of lured, lured myself into reading some like Clark Ashton Smith and some of the Weird Tales writers because of Smith's California-ness, and, and I was interested in him as a California writer. And so I started, and I also was asked, at one point I was asked to review a, a book of Ligotti's for The Guardian. This was a couple of years ago, and I'll put a link to that, by the way, on this talk. And I started to realize pretty quickly that these were actually really interesting writers of these genres, and, and that you know I don't know if they're all like this. Um, I, again, the other another writer who put me off horror fiction was Stephen King. I, I won't belabor my dis. I can never read a Stephen King book without just getting so bored, and there's so many of them. And so I sort of dismissed the whole horror fiction world as that. Okay, so I was wrong. And, and uh, Clark Ashton Smith is worth reading. Robert Eichmann's really worth reading. Really interesting short story writer. And Thomas Ligotti, very strange writer. This is called Teatro Grotesco. Okay, excuse my pronunciation, by the way, uh, buttweeds out there. But I'm going to pronounce everything wrong. But Teatro Grotesco is his uh, collection of stories. It's his, his fourth collection of stories, I believe. And he mainly is a short story writer which is not, uh, interesting to me. That's why I like Eichmann, somebody Eichmann, somebody who's just spent their uh, uh, lives in that field. And they and he also writes the types of stories that I like, which are kind of lengthy stories. So they're not these little four, five, six-page minimalist stuff. They're fairly substantive stories. They really lure you in, and they really shut the door on you. Um, and Ligotti has a particularly, as he gets more, as his writing develops, I've read his first few books, he starts to, uh, uh, you know, uh, he starts to uh, tread certain patterns in his work, which are never boring and they're never redundant. But he, he you pretty much know where generally the stories are taking you. I'll say just a few quick things. I, I, I like this may not be the best place to start with him, but it's, it's just I wanted to talk about it as a single book. Because single book collections are much more interesting to me than you know the best of type stuff. And Teatro Grotesco comes along as his fourth book, and they're very thematically intertwined stories. And the narrators, most of them are narrated by a first person presence um, who's who's not terribly specific and who's dislodged in this kind of very general, vague, slightly Kafkaesque uh, world of urban world of living in a little city. Um, it starts with a much more the type of stories I think Ligotti wrote more of in his early work, which is a story called Purity. The narrative is a little more specific. It's a little more conventionally narrated. It's really a freaky, weird story. And his stuff is extremely disturbing and dark, about as dark as you can get. And yet at the same time, they're very funny. 
He's a really funny writer, and he remind who he reminds me most of is Beckett. We talked a little bit about Beckett a while back, and he he puts his characters in these kind of relentless obsessiveness, obsessive journeys, trying to understand something, which ultimately the understanding of it completely uh, uh, rips them into just meaninglessness. It basically just devours them, and the uh, the game plan of a Ligotti story. I'm going to do this quite briefly. Is uh, is basically we live any aspiration to life. <laughs> that sounds cheerful. Or art. Teatro Grotesco is very obsessed, very interested in the notion of us being artists and trying to make beautiful things and to extol our own visions of the world and create beautiful things out of ourselves. And that is to to uh, to Ligotti like the the idea of a journey to do something for Beckett is just the utmost irony. Because as you're trying to aspire to to present this vision you have, you realize that the body that you live in has all the control over you. And that we pretend we have a mind and that this body is taking us apart because it's just going to die. Now, that's now I know that doesn't sound very cheerful, but he puts these into kind of narrative ideas and narrative situations which are very peculiar, very disturbing, very very absorbing and funny. So, for example, um, there's so many different stories in here about art. The title story, Teatro Grotesco, is about this kind of, again, uh, Kafkaesque village or town where there's this place called the Teatro Grotesco, which basically comes in and plays tricks on people and, play, and does these kind of uh, performance art pieces. There's a lot of performance art pieces in this book. And those performance art pieces kind of draw people into an illusion or an artistic position and then basically tears them down and just takes them to pieces. Um, and, and, and it's usually that taking down to pieces is sometimes violent, but it's more often than not a philosophical, physiological recognition. And, and, and you go, Lugani just loves, he just goes into each one of these stories almost like the same guy going into the same situation over and over. And he, he just finds these interesting ways to tell these stories. One of the stories I liked was called The Bungalow House, which is about a man who's who goes into a performance a, a local art gallery. There's lots of cheesy art galleries in this book. And this book is it's it really has a coherence to it. It really feels like one one book. One uh, one story through all these different stories. And he goes into this art gallery and he finds a performance art piece where he listens to a tape. And the tape basically describes really hopeless visions of awful places. So the picture, one of them is a bungalow that's it's dark and, the, and the, the carpets are covered with dead vermin. Okay, so that's the image of, of this first performance art piece that he listens to on a tape. And every day he goes back to this place, he becomes obsessed by these, and he's really interested, and he's drawn into this, because all of the Ligotti characters are drawn into this kind of a recognition that that's real. That's real, and everything else we've been doing is not real at all. And they, and they get drawn into this, and there's a very interesting little story that develops in it. Again, it always reminds me of Beckett. And I thought I'd read a little passage here, because it's a kind of a, an excellent little picture, and then I'd leave you with Ligotti. Um, and he, he's describing the, one, of the, one of the tapes he listens to. Uh, in fact, the tape recording entitled The Derelict Factory with a Dirt Floor and Voices. These are basically it's, it's images of interiors of dead buildings was of shorter duration than the bungalow house plus silence. But I found it no less wonderful in picturing the same infinite terror and dreariness. For approximately 15 minutes on my lunch break, I embraced the degraded beauty of the derelict factory, a narrow ruin that stood isolated upon a vast plain, its broken windows allowing only the most meager haze of moonlight to shine across its floor of hard-packed dirt where dead machinery lay buried in a grave of shadows and languished in the echoes of hollow, senseless voices. How utterly desolate, yet all the same wonderfully comforting, was the voice that communicated its message to me through the medium of a tape recorder. To think that another person shared my love for the icy bleakness of things, the satisfaction I felt at hearing that monotonal and somewhat distorted voice speaking so intimately of scenes and sensations that perfectly echoed certain aspects 
of my own deepest nature. This was an experience that even then, as I sat on the floor of Dalla's art gallery, listening to the tape through enormous headphones, might have been heartbreaking. But I wanted to believe that the artist who created these dream monologues about the bungalow house and the derelict factory had not set out to break my heart or anyone's heart. I wanted to believe that this artist had escaped the dreams and demons of all sentiment in order to explore the foul and crummy delights of a universe where everything had been reduced to three stark principles. First, that there was nowhere for you to go. Second, that there was nothing for you to do. And third, that there was no one for you to know. Of course, I knew that this view was an illusion like any other, but it was also one that has sustained me so long and so well, as long and as well as any other illusion, and perhaps longer, perhaps better. So I'll go back to this phrase, um, there's nowhere for you to go, there's nothing for you to do, there was no one for you to know. <laughs> so it's basically existentialism, but with a kind of really strong narrative drive to each of the stories. And it and it takes you basically, if you think of the nausea in the Sartre, you know, that, that sense that there's this imminence of physical things drawing you into the world and just leaking out your identity. In Ligotti, it's a it's it's a horrific thing in which somebody's always watching you as you lose everything. Um, I, I don't. It's not a very good way of describing it. The stories are really fascinating. They're fun. They they're actually are fun. They're well written. They're they're obsessive about certain ideas, and they yet they always find a new way of telling the same story in a way. So I really I really check him out. I, I'm, I'm enjoying his work. Um, I I I don't. I guess this is as good a place to start. There's a two volume. There's a, there's a Penguin edition of two books of Ligotti's, which is also good. But I I think this is a quite a strong book, and I wanted to do maybe a couple other Ligotti collections because I do believe that there's a coherence to that one volume that's worth reading on its own. And it and it is it's a little it's a it's a little bit of horror, a little bit of Beckett, and 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 a lot of this guy Ligotti, who's a very interesting writer. So uh, worth trying. All right, so we'll uh, we'll see you next week, and I'll probably I'll change my shirt. I, I've been a couple of these in one day, so don't think I'd wear the pink shirt all for like a whole week. But I I'm going to do two or three uh, in, a, in, a, in this weekend. All right, have a have a uh, have a good week, and uh, and and uh, just lock the door when you go in the bathtub. Lock the door; it's really important. Okay, don't let anyone in. All right, bye.